अभी नींद ले लो पूरा ओके वी आर लाइफ वी कैन स्टार्ट कोयटा शॉप गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू दिस सेकंड सेशन ऑफ आल्सो प्लास्टिक कॉन्क्लेव एंड आई विल हैंड इट ओवर डायरेक्टली टू आवर कन्वीनर डॉक्टर किरण खरात एंड डॉक्टर सुरेंद्र पाटिल ओवर टू यू सर uh thank you very much ashok uh i welcome uh dr surendra patil as my co-host and the eminent uh, speakers and the panelists the first webinar of the series had an overwhelming response of nearly 4000 viewers and i thank the audience for their participation and for ashok for doing his magic with the technical support so to begin this second webinar uh i would like to remind the audience of the phrase getting it right the first time both the stalwart uh, speakers used this sentence uh, in their talks uh, in other words we have only one bite at the cherry and the hip replacement is an operation which we should aim to do that it lasts for at least more than 20 years and you know excels in its outcome so the start was successful because we laid the foundation of how to approach plan template and thus perform the operation in the mind anticipate complications and keep inventory ready as it is logical for the particular case and therefore we can now proceed to the thought processes about implants in this webinar uh, the speakers uh, have been allocated two topics one will talk on uh, uncemented acetabulum and the other speaker will talk on a uh, cemented acetabulum their remit has been given to them to talk about design principles instrumentation with special emphasis on key instruments which makes surgery easier and handling how to use those instruments and the tips to make the surgery reproducible and how this will affect this technique will affect the long term performance and outcomes i'm very uh, privileged to have with me two eminent uh, experienced surgeons uh, Dr Mahesh Kulkarni is a senior pelvic acetabular and hip replacement and joint replacement surgeon uh, with expertise in revision and primary uh, working in Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital one of the premier institutes in Pune and we had Dr Nikhil Shah who opened the webinar with his previous uh, talk which was very excellent on how to plan the total hip replacement and now he is here with us to also discuss his thoughts on the cemented cup so without any further ado i would uh, welcome everybody in this webinar and hand over to dr mahesh kulkarni to talk to us about uncemented acetabulum thank you uh, thank you very much kiran and uh, good to see um, dr narendra vikas and surendra here as well as nikhil so the first thing we're going to do is um, talk about the design of cementless acetabular components um majority of the surgeons in india would probably end up using cementless components for variety of reasons we can discuss about these reasons uh, in depth um, later on um uh, i'm i hope the slides are visible kiran uh, you can yes they are yeah. please continue so we'll briefly go through um, history um, of uh, cementless acetabular components followed by the design philosophy have a look at the clinical results and the future trends um using these uncemented cups they were introduced nearly um way back in 1980 cemented cups were performing extremely well they are still performing extremely well however in long term studies there was a question uh, especially in the northern um, american states that there was increasing radiographic and clinical loosening uh, seen with these cemented components and i think majority of them um, probably thought that it was a demanding surgical technique which there is no doubt it is you need to be exact in your technique for a cemented cup to obtain bloodless field and get proper cement pressurization to obtain long term satisfactory results um they became rapidly popular because i think they are slightly easier as compared to cemented components they have an advantage of biological fixation but the biggest advantage that most of the surgeons like is the modularity which is associated with um, the cementless components there are issues however of cementless cups of polythene wear 
as well as osteolysis, which can cause problem in the medium to long term as well. So what are the critical factors for success of uncemented cup? Initial implant stability. So the primary stability of that cup is crucial. If you can't achieve primary interoperative stability, you are doomed uh, for failure. You need to have or create appropriate, appropriate acquisition surface so that you can allow for bony in-growth or on-growth. And the design features of the pores we will talk in subsequent slides. You need to have intimate contact of the surface with the host bone so that there is some um, uh, in-growth or on-growth onto the acetabular shell itself. And obviously the component positioning doesn't really change uh, whether you use a cemented or an uncemented component. Now the initial stability is important because if you have micro motion um, uh, of less than say 50 microns, you'll get reliable bony in-growth. So if the cup is not moving much, even microns of movement of more than 50 microns of movement will cause problems with ingrowth and will lead to ingrowth of fibrous tissue and sometimes catastrophic failure leading from it. And if there are gaps, if your implant is not in touch with the host bone, then again, osteointegration is going to be uh, hampered. Now, there are a um, variety of materials by which you can um, uh, make an acetabular component. Um, there were early attempts to implant non-metallic component, but they have unacceptable failure rates um, which basically were all polythene or all ceramic threaded cups, which were used in initial days, which ultimately uh, led to earlier failure of these implants. The primary materials in today's day are titanium or cobalt chromium alloys and tantalum or um, trish, uh, tritanium, uh, which is a new material which is being used by one of the companies. Um, what are the differences between titanium versus cobalt chrome? Most of the components now are titanium. Um, the titanium material itself allows you to have a high amount of bone in growth, although the qualitative bone formed is same in both uh, cobalt chrome and titanium. The implant becomes more flexible, so it is easier to use a press fit technique with a lower risk of fracture as compared to cobalt chrome, which again stands true from the femoral side as well. The lower modulus of elasticity will prevent um, stress shielding of the host bone and also it is easier to work with and less expensive as compared to cobalt chromium. What about the new materials such as tantalum, which is the trabecular metal cup, uh, which is basically one of the elemental uh, material with high porosity of nearly 80%. The modulus of elasticity again is closer to titanium um, and closer to the bone as compared to titanium as well. And the coefficient of friction is very high as compared to standard material which will allow you to gain that initial stability um, when you are implanting or using it as a press fit structure. Um, if you can see the structure is very porous with roughness onto the surface as well, leading to scratch fit um, achieved um, uh, much better as compared to the standard materials. Now, what about the implant geometry? So if you take a hemisection of a, a sphere, you get a perfectly hemispherical cup. These are the most popular uncemented cups that are being used. The dual geometry um, are uh, basically the cup is slightly um, expanded at the equator itself, making it slightly wider at the mouth of the cup as compared to the dome of the cup. And we'll go through them. And then the threaded cups, which are not uh, available to us in India. So for a full hemisphere design, as I said, if you take a complete circle and cut it into half, which is the 180 degree surface, allows you to maximize the contact between the surface of the cup and the bone itself. And these increased contact area also improves the resistance to torque and also prevents any poly debris by leaving any exposed bone at the periphery. What about the elliptical cup or what is also known as a dual geometry component? This is a hemi-ellipsoidal. So if you can see at the, the, the maximum diameter, the press fit allows you two millimeter more um, of an equatorial press fit. Uh, the acetabulum is reamed hemispherically, but allows you the press fit at the periphery. The problem is, however, if you can see if your cup hangs on onto the rim of the acetabulum, and sometimes you may not get surface contact at the dome of the acetabulum, and it will decrease the amount of bony in growth. The cup that is available for us uh, in India for the dual mobility or the, uh, the dual geometry or the elliptical cup is a Trident PSL cup. Trident has two cups. 
one is a hemispherical cup and one is a psl cup or equatorially expanded cup the trabecular metal revision cup is also an equatorially expanded or elliptical cup and i gather although max does not say it also they have an elliptical cup and you and um, i will tell you the implications of them when we go through the video now the threaded cups depend on mechanical interlock however they give you poor mechanical stability and they have a decreased contact area with the native acetabulum and they are also technically difficult and not available in our country now so forget about threaded cups uh, in total so it, these examples were the zweimuller cup or the omnifit ha coated uh, implants were the examples of a threaded cup now what about surface coating you can uh, create surface coating which allows you to have short and long term success so sintering um, these are ways by which you can actually attach the surface coating onto the implant material so the sintering of titanium fiber mesh can be done such as a cup uh, like trilogy or uh, the 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 new trilogy i forget its name um the trilogy it both have titanium fiber mesh sintered onto it or you can have small or large beads like um, <clears throat> pora coat onto um a, a pinnacle or a durolock or even a reflection cup uh, which is manufactured by smith and nephew the pores if they are less than 50 microns in size they will not allow blood vessels to grow into it and the maturation tissue will not be uniform and what happens if the pores are larger in size the ingrowth is slow and consistent inconsistent uh, uh, inconsistent and the ingrowth is mainly fibrous and if you have large pore size the sintered beads may not actually um, stay on the surface and they might shear off leading to further problems um, as well so the porous coated these are the sintered beads which can be attached onto the surface um, under high temperature and uh, conditions and the average pore size usually is around 250 microns or you can have this fiber mesh as i said it's available in the trilogy and trilogy it cup the pore size is less than 400 microns the porosity is about 50% of the volume so that's not very weak it is an open pore network and in the long term if you see all the cups this cup has probably given excellent long term survivorship with the titanium fiber mesh design you can add hydroxyapatite coating onto the beads or the fiber mesh itself this is an osteoconductive material the initial failures of ha cups were because the cups were smooth there was no textured surface onto it and the cups um, relied on press fit for initial stability there were no screws onto it Uh, and that uh, that is why it uh, went on for aseptic loosening and poor results with the earlier hydroxyapatite coating but now these are applied as a thin layer on either grit blasted or sintered implants you can use it with tricalcium phosphonate uh, phosphate uh, with a consistent layer of hydroxyapatite on a plasma spray flame um, which will lead to os accelerated osteo integration with these new designs so once you understood the basic um, a design of this uh, cup so we talked about the geometry of the component now we talked about uh, we will also talk about coating which will allow either in growth or on growth and then we'll talk about what are the adjunctive fixations so you can either use it only as a press fit you can supplement it with threaded screws or you can use spikes or fins onto it so the press fit is dependent on various amount of under reaming of the acetabulum compared to the final implant however if you're not careful you'll create insertional fractures of the pelvis or the acetabulum you might lead to a, you might cause incomplete seating of the component which will be bad in the long term and the insertional fractures are more commonly seen in elderly females especially also people suffering from inflammatory arthritis where the bone is going to be weak threaded screws are the strongest mode of fixation and they can augment initial stability if you are in doubt Uh, the concerns are potential neurovascular injuries if you don't follow the zones of the acetabulum and the screw holes itself if not blocked can allow access of polythene wear debris leading to ballooning osteolysis behind the retro um, acetabular socket area the adjunctive fixations i hate them you can either have fins around the cup or you can have spikes on the dome or the periphery of the cup um they can actually lead to incomplete seating of component and if you're not careful Uh, the chances of increased fractures um, at the time of surgery as well the biggest advantage of uh, the acetabular component being used as a cementless component is the modularity but obviously it comes with the problems of wear on the back side of the polythene socket 
um, which is the, the third uh, generation where you can lead to osteolysis because of that and failure of locking mechanism. If the locking mechanism in the previous generation cups was a problem, but the modularity gives you options of wearing either using a, a flat polythene or an elevated polythene liner, a ceramic liner or a metal liner in dual mobility cup. So it improves or a constrained liner which improves the armamentarium for a hip surgeon, especially into complex cases as well. So if you see the clinical results, as I have said earlier, the titanium fiber metal mesh probably has the lowest rates of revision for loosening. The first generation cups like the PCA, ARC, HGP1, I don't think we are using them anymore, had pelvic osteolysis because of backside wear, because of micro motion between the liner and the shell as the locking mechanism was not very well evolved at that time. And the surface, the inside surface of the shell was also not smoothened out and it was a rough shape, which caused more of backside wear. If you see the long-term results of these um, as well, if you see the HGP Zimmer um, right to PCA cups, the survivorship at 99 and ranging from 83%. Some of the studies have pretty long follow-up, uh, like the Zimmer cup 16 years follow-up, but some of them are also short-term uh, follow-ups as well. The second generation cups had improved manufacturing with decreased number of screw holes. The locking mechanism improved significantly and the surface of the inside of the shell was polished. Hydroxyapatite coating on the outside of the shell and the newer materials have given you much better results. Now, I mean, if you see the results of Durolock cup um, at the follow-up of nearly 10 year, 99%. And the last I checked, 17 year results of Durolock as well as the Trilogy cup have been brilliant. And if you see the porous coated plus HA cups, such as reflection um, cup from Smith and Nephew, you can see 100% survivorship at five years. Now the survivorship is available at 15 years. And the ODEP rating for uh, the reflection cup is again 13 A star. So I think we have got fantastic results with these. So we've looked through the design features of uncemented cup, including the material that we can use. Titanium probably is the best, followed by uh, the tantalum as well. The implant geometry, whether they are hemispherical, elliptical, um, uh, or uh, surface coating, whether it is um, grid blasted, sintering of porous, uh, sintering of beads, fiber mesh, hydroxyapatite, the modularity we've talked about, and we briefly touched upon the clinical results. In the future, I think the aim is to improve the long-term fixation and reduce osteolysis. So there are a variety of methods by which you can reduce that osteolysis by blocking the screw holes and uh, several other uh, mechanisms by which you can prevent osteolysis. Bearing surfaces are currently being improved. The polythene has been changing. That's a matter for another talk. Um, again, the biological interference with bone resorption and bone ingrowth continues to be evolved as well. So that was a talk about um, design features. Now, do you want me to continue with the Technical tips, Kiran, or you want to take some questions beforehand? Actually, uh, yes. Uh, the thing is, you should continue the talk, but as you set up the video, I think you got a video next, right? Yeah. So it is important that uh, you know you tell us the technical aspects where you know it can be reproducible and it will also impact the longevity and the outcome yeah. of all Even the theory few, we learned. Few design points. Can we discuss now? Or yes, we can. can. Yes, yeah, you can. Yeah, no problem. So one thing uh, Mahesh clearly brought out that modularity being an advantage can also have its issues. However, as we follow the generations of cup, the with the cross line cross link poly coming in, the backside issue wears has reduced. Yeah. So earlier the issues were that there was around the screw osteolysis due to back pumping of the particles. Even the first generation design had the locking mechanism not so good. So the liner would not seat completely onto the floor of the cup. And there was pumping action happening. And with the backside wear and pumping, these polyparticles used to go back. And that is when the concept of screw covers or a monoblock cup had come. So we, in fact, used uh, monoblock stabler components for a good two years in Army Hospital RNR. But Gradually, we realized as the literature came out that screws are not a disadvantage. Screws, uh, the peri screw osteolysis issue was due to the poly quality. 
and screw augment the primary fixation. In fact, there are some retrieval studies which have shown that the maximum uh, that spot welds which you get of integration of the cup could be at the neck of these screws. And uh, we have also noticed when we go in for revision sometimes, the screws are really holding the cup well. So there have been some debate whether the screws have to be used or not. But as the poly improves, as the design of locking mechanism improves and backside wear goes down, uh, the uh, screw option and the modularity uh, is something which you could use. About the modularity, unfortunately, in our country, the poly options are limited. Whereas abroad, they have the lateralized liner, the labeled ones. Here, either the company guy is giving the, either the labeled one or the neutral one. The, rarely, Depu gives the plus four lateralized. So liner options, you should always check with, with your vendor. And per op, if there is any need for restoring offsets, for covering your, uh, correcting your version a bit by these lip liners, although they have their own issues of some edge loading and an uncovered liner edge, but still they could be used on table. This modularity option, although available, is not sometimes being provided by the company. They either give the lift or the neutral. Ideal is a neutral liner with no edge loading issues in a well-oriented cup. So what are your thoughts about, uh, and what does the panel think about this modularity and the screw issues? Yeah, the screws, issues. I think I use the screws in uncemented cups for less than 10% of the time. So primarily it is the press fit fixation that you can achieve with a good um, cup, uh, which you've been used consistently and with the reproducible technique, which is probably most crucial. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to put screws in if um, at all there is porotic bone um, or uh, I'm not happy with the fixation. You already open, opened up the cup. You can't just chuck it in the bin. And if you got decent, we will talk about it in the surgical technique, um, how to judge stability of the cup. But if you got good stability, uh, but you want additional uh, in an obese, uh, morbidly obese patient, I wouldn't hesitate to put a couple of screws in. So but um, yeah, I wouldn't um, worry too much about... Um, yeah, although first option would be a press fit, but you would not... Yeah, always 90% of the times it will be a press fit cup, uh, unless it's a revision scenario. And um, the liners, obviously, whatever um, is available, you have to choose from one of them. Um, and... Um, the lateralized liner, as you said, is not available for us. So basically a low threshold for screws. And uh, would you, uh, you know, use one screw or two screws? I mean, what are your... I have a high threshold for screws, I would say. I wouldn't okay. use it unless it is necessary. And um, I, uh, you, I would use two if I have to. Okay. Won't use a single screw. Mahesh, just, uh, just to summarize your talk, uh, which I would like to know is that what is the material which you prefer to use and what kind of finish you prefer to use, what coating you prefer and why? Because you told us about so many options and what, what do you prefer out of these and why? Preferred cup for me is going to be a hemispherical cup okay. in a primary scenario. So I wouldn't go for an elliptical cup. I would go for a hemispherical cup um, with uh, coating, centered coating such as either coat or titanium fiber mesh. It doesn't matter. Both have excellent track record in the long term. So it is the ease of your handling and the, your reproducibility with that cup matters. And the third thing is, um, what was the third thing you talked about? Hemispherical cup um, with three screw holes. So it's a sector cup like uh, situation. Um, and I would use um, screws if necessary, as I have said. Um, Hydroxyapatite, I wouldn't too bother too much about HA coating um, as a necessity for the cups that I'm using as a press fit. You highlighted a few things about backside wear. Would you consider, if, uh, what would you do to uh, reduce that backside wear in terms of, you know, would you like to use a inside uh, polished cup or would you like to block those screw holes with screw hole covers? Well, unfortunately, <clears throat> we are all restricted by the cost um, of implants. The, each plug that you use to block a screw hole is going to cost the patient quite significantly, probably much more than a screw. Oh, as uh, much as a screw, I guess. Yeah, so they, as probably as much as a screw. Yeah. And um, honestly, as Vikas has mentioned, with the advent of new generation polythene, it wouldn't matter. All the cups that we've been using, like Pinnacle, which has got now 17-year survivorship or more, actually more, 
Durolog Cup, the Trilogy Cup, all have shown excellent results without even uh, blocking the screw holes. So I wouldn't worry. I think it was a problem with the first generation cup. Even the design so was the, a... Is the inside mm -hmm. polished surface of the cup? Most of them are polished from inside. The ones we are available now. About the design issue yeah, and coating. The audience, when they choose their implant, they should be probably uh, looking at these things. I would choose an implant which has a long track record, first thing. So you need to look at if whatever, I mean, you look at studies, uh, you can look at the joint registry data, or you can look at the ODEP rating. So I, you need to first make sure that you're using an implant which is proven its test of time over a long term. The second is what kind of instrumentation are they providing you? If the company service is not good and they're providing you with inferior uh, instrumentation, I wouldn't touch that um, instrument or the cup. And the third thing is my ease and reproducibility of doing that operation consistently over a period of time. I should be able to ream line to line or whatever I have decided for that cup. We'll talk about it in the technical dis discussion, but it should be reproducible in your hands so that uh, you don't have to worry each time that you're doing the surgery, whether this cup is going to achieve press fit or not. So each surgeon will differ. You will have your preferences, but my um, choice goes according to these criteria. So good track record, ease of instrumentation, availability of all implants, liners, and then my consistency with achieving good results with that implant. So I think that's fair enough uh, to... Uh, one uh, question proceed. I just want to ask, Kiran. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. If we take out the part of the cost involved into the screws and the plugs, so uh, if if that if cost is not a concern, would you recommend to plug all the screw holes if you're not using the screws inside? Yeah. Or you can use a cup to begin with if you're confident of your press fit. Press fit. Um, then you can use a screw less without uh, a cup without screws, without screw screws. holes at all. And then you can just use a central blocking uh, plug. So uh, in this, there is a point. Now with the, as we say, uh, talk about it, we have used those screw plug holes in Trilogy IT and the uh, Smith & Nephew Cup regularly for about a couple of years, as I mentioned. But uh, over a period of time now, it is quite uh, uh, evident in the literature that its role is very, very limited. And that's why most of the companies are not. They're even withdrawing the solid cups because of two issues. You could not make out the bottom out, bottoming out because the hand there is no hole which shows you the bottoming out of the cup in a solid cup. So... Uh, that is another issue which was coming up and uh, consistently without, as Mahesh brought out, without plugging the holes also, these cups at uh, long-term follow-up are showing no peri-screw osteolysis, which was an issue in the generation one and two cup. Just one more point I wanted to highlight, which Mahesh has already categorized the cup and maybe when we talk about implanting these cups, we would discuss, but by and large, the audience needs to know that we have a group of cups which are 3D coated and which are ultra porous, we call it, or a 3D coat where bone would grow into the 3D coating. There is a sprayed cup or a standard 2D coating cup, which is the most available porous coated cup, which are plasma sprayed or they are two dimensional coating. The third one, which is totally different in handling and characteristics and which also have very good track record is the Trilogy, which is a fiber mesh. And that is the only such cup available in our country. It needs a different handling characteristic, which is it's kind of a spongy outer layer and needs uh, under preparation. And then the HA coat, which has its issues. So most of the companies are again withdrawn. The, the Trilogy IT with HA has gone. The only the Evolutus has his its HA. So these four are by and large the categories. And based on that cup, we would be discussing later how can to I, handle the issues. Can I, can I differ here a little? Because the plasma spray is very much different from centered beads. They are two separate. The centered bead is three-dimensional coat. So three-dimensional coating is yeah. where the bone ingrows. So that's uh, like a continue the tantalum or a center. I think this uh, sets us up for the technical aspects which Mahesh is ready with. But uh, word of caution, uh, because the ultra porous uh, designs uh, uh, are to be, you know, viewed with caution because the most recent literature on it is is, you know, suspect. So that's just one article which says that they yeah. may be having. Yeah. Uh, because each ultra porous design is different. The, so, uh, in so Mahesh says, you know, go for a good track record and yeah. with implants which you can reproduce consistently. No, don't okay, get Mahesh. carried away by what the company reps are telling you with the yes. new, each new introduction. Yes. 
So I think what we'll do is I use a posterior approach. So I'm going to, I think you've complete covered approaches last time. So I'm going to probably um, fast Not forward. really. Uh, we didn't cover it, but... Uh... Okay, so I'll just, it's a small video, just two videos. So I use a standard posterior approach each time um, when I'm doing a hip replacement surgery. So the standard um, skin and fascial incision, nothing too much different. I use a Chanli retractor. Um, this is the superior end. This is the inferior end. Um, you create space uh, space under the gluteus medius. Use a Homan retractor to lift off the gluteus medius, as you, we've done here. This is the quadratus femoris here. Um, and then you identify the piriformis and the short external rotators. I use um, um, tag suture, such as a vicryl um, uh, suture, a number one vicryl. And I like to dissect out the capsule um, and the external rotators as a separate layer. I always release the gluteus maximus and the superior border of uh, quadratus femoris tendon here to get orientation of the um, lesser trochanter. Then tag the capsule as well and make an L-shaped incision into the capsule so that you've got something to repair back into. And then um, you should have done templating to understand what is going to be your neck cat. This is what we're tagging now, the tax capsule. Um, use a resection guide if you know how much of uh, neck um, uh, calcar you need to maintain. Using a long blade, a thick blade, we clear the labrum from inside the acetabulum. And then let me just show you, I don't use any pins, any Judd pins or Chanley pins that are called. I just use two homans. One is a slightly blunt homan, which goes anterior inferiorly. So this is the tal. This homan goes at the inferior edge of the tal. And I want to use as a slightly blunt homan because the femoral neurovascular bundle will be pretty close. And then I use a blunt homan. So I make an incision into the capsule posterior inferiorly to allow you to insert a broad homan um, in the posterior aspect. So one homan is at the anterior inferior edge of the tal. Other homan is at the posterior inferior edge of the tal. And this is the fovea with the tal. You get a nice 360 degree exposure. And I use um, what we call as a northwest retractor or a mastoid retractor to, within the capsule so that you're not resting onto the sciatic nerve. And then if you are struggling with acetabular exposure, I would just release the reflected head of rectus femoris from here superiorly, um, which will allow you to draw the femur forward. Um, exactly, uh, you do the same by releasing the gluteus maximus from the insertion on the linear aspera. So once you are set, the first thing I do is use a reamer. Now, when you use the first reamer, and if you're using a set which you really haven't used before, be gentle with the first reamer, which is going slightly vertical to take the floor of the acetabulum or the medial osteophyte. So the direction of reaming for the first reamer is straight down to get rid of the medial osteophyte to go to the floor of the acetabulum in majority of cases. Now, if the reamer is extremely sharp and you, because you haven't used it, you don't know um, what, um, how much is the sharpness because the company implants will, instruments will keep on changing. So be gentle with pressure on it. Judge what is the sharpness of the reamer with the first one. So once you ream, uh, take away the floor of the uh, uh, floor osteophyte, then you get your reamer into the direction that you want to get proper antiversion and inclination. So my antiversion is dictated by a couple of things. One is the TAL. If it is present, nearly 90% of the primary cases, you will see the TAL. So I have my homans placed appropriately. One assistant is crucial who will allow me to ream between those two homans, which gets my antiversion sorted. So the inferior edge of the reamer should be parallel to the TAL, which will sort out in 9 out of 10 times your antiversion. And also the inclination. The, if the inferior edge of the uh, reamer is actually too low as compared to the border of the tal. That means your cup is a bit too closed or abducted. If the inferior edge of the reamer is prouder as compared to the tal, that means this end is dipped inside, you will get opening of the cup. So the tal in 90% of the cases will guide you um, about um, the position of the cup independent of the position of the patient on the operation table. But make sure that you position the patient yourselves if, because if the tal is not present, then you also have to depend on the patient positioning uh, intraoperatively. 
Now, once you start dreaming, I call it as a titrated dreaming. I so this is what I am saying. Um, in between the homan, if the dreamer is bang in the middle, which means you are getting your version right, which is independent, even if the patient has fallen off because the the posts are not good enough, you can still rely in nine out of ten times on the tal um, uh, position. So once you start dreaming, um, I will start with a small dreamer. There are varied people who actually. just calculate the femoral head diameter and start with that size i believe i am a little bit um, stingy with uh, techniques so i would start reaming and gradually going up in uh, twos so i will sequentially ream the acetabulum in the same direction maintaining the position of the reamer and making sure that i have got contact at the periphery and also i have started seeing subchondral bleeding bone what you need to understand is you cannot ream through um the cancellous uh, the subchondral bony plate and end up into cancellous bone especially in osteoporotic and elderly patients so you start reaming once your reamer has had a grip and if you have punctate bleeding all over then you can decide the choice of the cup now how do i decide the choice of the cup if you go through the company brochures for each implant most of them would suggest you to under ream by 2 mm but please don't believe it blindly so the safest technique is i ream line to line so if i have reamed 50 i will take a trial of 50 and see if i can fit it in so the first thing i do is after 50 reaming i feel a good contact has been made good punctate bleeding has been seen soft tissue has been cleared from the edge of the cup you take the 50 trial and insert it inside the acetabulum now if the trial is hanging on onto the mouth and you cannot really insert it i stop at that stage and ream the mouth uh, of the acetabulum or ream of the acetabulum again with the 50 with a slow reaming make sure you always ream it don't put it on drill and then try and reinsert the cup so this is the trial cup now if this is not going in at this stage don't whack it in if you start hammering it in and you know that the posterior wall is thin or the anterior wall is thin you will crack it and if you haven't exposed the acetabulum properly you won't even see it so titrate it titrate your reaming i will go for line to line reaming for each and every cup here the grip is not good so what we've done is um, we will take the cup out go for reaming again you can do two things if you feel that the peripheral contact is good but you still not getting a press fit you can go one size down with your reamer and ream medially so push it slightly medial by a millimeter or two which will allow your trial to fit in again take your trial again spend some time i think in hip replacement the most important time to spend on is exposure followed by titrated press fitting of both the implant don't rush through it so again i will ream make sure that i have got a um, good press fit of the trial now if i don't get good press fit of the trial i would not open that cup if your trial is not standing free after you've inserted it that means you should not be opening up the final implant at this stage now there are differences now this is for a hemispherical cup i am talking about for hemispherical cup as well other panelists might differ i ream line to line put the cup in two things might happen one is the line to line reaming in a exp- extremely soft bone you will notice that the trial does not fit in in that case you take the next trial you take then you take the next size up which is 52 and try and fit it in if the trial is not going in i will ream by 1 mm and try and reinsert the 52 trial and that will go in so be titrated don't under ream in each and every patient uh, it depends on the elasticity of the bone um, as well as well as the implant design this was this was for a hemispherical cup what happens if you are using a, a peripherally or equatorially expanded cup like a trident cup which is a psl cup if it is there now the company person sometimes doesn't know what is handing over to you so i asked for a trident hemispherical sh- a cup once they got me the hemispherical cups both are available in india so i had both hemispherical and psl cups i said i'm going to use a hemispherical cup but the buggers had only bought a tr- brought a trial for a psl so you can't whack in a trial for psl and then expect you to put a hemispherical cup so these are all important issues you need to remember so for an elliptical cup if the trial you rely rim to 50 put a trial of 50 if it is not going in 
I will ream by one more millimeter. So I will go extra reaming for even a 50 size cup. I'll go 51 at the mouth, try the trial in. If it fits well, I will open the final cup. And sometimes even the final cup is slightly more in diameter because of the coating on it. Get the final cup in. See if you can introduce nearly one half of the cup inside the rim of the acetabulum. If it is not, I might just take hand reamer with 52 and then put a 50 PSL or equatorially expanded cup. So my warning is if you're using a Trident cup, if you're using a cup like R3 from uh, Smith & Nephew, which again has advanced in growth surfaces with stick tight coating, or if you're using a cup by Max, again, I would be very cautious of probably reaming one millimeter extra at the rim before putting the cup in. And I will check with the final cup whether or half of the cup is at least going in without uh, uh, before banging onto it. So these are crucial things. Understand the differences. Make sure that you're using the same cup consistently. Don't keep on changing the implant uh, for the heck of it. And make sure that you achieve press fit in at least 90% of your cases. So as I've said, I have reamed, uh, optimized reaming by probably one millimeter extra, then get the trial in and get the trial in uh, for my version, leave the handle, make sure that the trial doesn't pop off. And once I'm happy with that trial, I get my final cup. The screws are positioned in the posterior superior direction. And then um, you choose your liner. You can put a trial liner at this stage, do the femur and come back to do your um, final positioning of your liner. So I'm not going to go through the video of um, uh, femoral stem. And I'm, I will show one more video um, of the cup positioning and then we can take um, questions. Let me see, this is the same one, is it? Yeah. Sorry, just a second, Kiran, I will get it sorted. Bony ankylosis one I want to show. For some reason, it's the same thing opening again. So while you are uh, searching the video, yeah, uh, I would just discuss with the panelists and you can also listen in. Uh, the special instruments uh, required are very few. The main thing is to uh, place these instruments strategically to you know, give a 360 degree exposure. That's number one. And number two is you know, titrated reaming is extremely important and knowing your implant is very important. So you don't change it uh, frequently because you can get confused and the company person can get confused. So uh, if you found the video, we can go ahead with it. And, uh, or we can ask Narendra and uh, Vikas uh, or Surendra to chip in. Uh, uh, Mahesh has in detail brought out that how bony preparation is very important. And as much as it, uh, knowing your cup is important. So two things which are important in insertion of cup is knowing your cup, what kind of porosity and preparation it needs. At the same time, what bone you're handling. And common mistake done by a beginner is that you go by the company guideline, they say over ream, they say under ream, so you prepare as per that. The company guy who's on the trolley tells you that, no, sir, it is line to line. No, sir, it is, we need to under ream one. The thing is, for every patient, it is different. So what Mahesh has beautifully brought out are situations which dictate the preparation of bone. So you need to prepare the cup and then decide the size rather than you decide the size and prepare accordingly. So it is the other way around. You prepare your acetabulum, uh, expose it properly. If you want to use two retractors or you want to use the pin, there are no ups and downs of each, but 360 degree view is important to get your internal navigation in view. So the things you need to identify in the cup is the pubis, the Tal. These two are the least destroyed structures in any arthritic or uh, OA hip. Even if, even in a native hip, these two are the most reliable structures. So anteriorly, the pubis and inferiorly, and inferiorly the tal. And this would decide your overall cup positioning. Many times the posterior superior wall or superior, there is defect. There is sometimes it is soft and gets just slightly damaged during preparation. But antero-inferior is your guide. 
if you go parallel to it or inside it like mahesh told most of the time you would be right the pubis usually you should be just inside it if you are out either your version is incorrect or you are not medialized enough so these landmark identification and matching the landmark to your planning which we had discussed in our first lecture is very important at this stage that is why the uh, importance of exposing the cup well bone preparation already mahesh said we need to go by each bone each bone and then on the cup side as he mentioned that there are some companies where it is a ultra porous coat like a uh, r3 or even a continuum where you may have to err towards over preparation about a millimeter or so whereas th there are some company instrument issues like i think i have also used some max cups it's a australian cup which they bought over and there are some handling issues in that cup and the sizing is a problem there not the coating so the instrument and the trial and the cup match is an issue the preparation and the match the coating remains uh, 2d only there it is not a ultra porous coating uh, one more important point which i want to brought out bring out is after you have prepared well after we have trialed well you should while inserting also you have to be very careful so that maybe later when we talk about the surgical technique we'll go into the detail but just one point here that your hand insertion should be almost 70% or 80% of the cup should just go by hand even on especially if it is a ultra porous 3d coated cup otherwise it will sit on the mouth so hand insertion almost 60 to 80 depending on the uh, uh, coating on the cup is important and banging should be in the end and till the end you have to control the version otherwise in spite of preparing your cup well you may land up with a mal position cup so insertion is also as important uh that's well well summarized because uh, mahesh yeah uh, you mentioned in the video which was uh, a very good demonstration of the important tips you said the first uh, reamer which is usually a very sharp reamer you got to be very careful with that reamer you go vertically uh, sometimes you find that the medial ostophyte can be quite a you know a stubborn one and then do you have a special equipment like a gouge or something to you yeah. know make some you know inroads into it and, and then use that reamer which can become you know which can bite properly and then yeah, you I can think, uh, expand uh, it i think i agree with you um, i am careful because the inconsist inconsistency of the quality of reamers that the companies provide correct so one set might be new and extremely sharp whereas yes, the yes. other day the next day you might get a set which is completely a uh, beaten uh, seen much better days um, in the past so i think that's where each surgeon needs to be careful when they take the reamer and start reaming correct now sometimes i uh, because normally people use even size reamers so if i feel that the reamers are blunt then i start using odd reamers so i will start with 39 41 and 43 because they are usually unused and they correct. retain their sharpness so i think they are much better and only Absolutely. finally when i i am really gripping the bone i will go to line to line reaming with one uh, even sized uh, reamer but i completely agree with you that if you have a good gouge you can take out the medial ostophyte which will allow you to go to the pulvinar take out the fat and find the floor of the acetabulum and the reamer doesn't need to be pushed in medially at all yes because i've seen actually cases where this happens and there is lack of control and uh, you know disasters can happen uh, yeah. you know with this have you found your video mahesh yeah i'll uh, just show a very short less than 2 minute video again um, okay. of surgical technique let me just um, so two things you should ask closed hip two things you should ask your scrub tech before starting reaming is is the reamer new so we always keep that call out in the checklist reamer new or used and second thing is if they have serially all not just or even all uh, sequentially all reamers Okay, Mahesh. So this one is an angspawn patient. Um, we will not go into details of spinopelvic issues here. So we will stick to um, reaming in um, such difficult or ankylosed hips, flexed. Fortunately, not externally rotated. Most of my cases, I will continue to stick to my posterior approach. I don't like chopping and changing the approaches because it will create further problems. Um, I have started using infiltration right from the start. which makes um, bleeding um, really limited gives you fantastic exposure and provides post operative analgesia as well 
I preserve the bursa and repair it in the end. Here you can see the shiny piriformis tendon, and you tilt the table slightly forward so that you can see between the gap in an ankylosed hip between the posterior border of the trochanter and the acetabular lip. So you get your tagging sutures in in the gamelai again and the quadratus, and you go in between the gluteus minimus and the superior border of piriformis, and then come along the neck. Here you have to do an in situ osteotomy. Make sure your assistant doesn't rotate the hip when you are doing the in situ osteotomy. Um, the neck usually is being left long, so I refashion the cut because if you don't cut the neck, you won't get adequate exposure of the acetabulum. So make sure once you've done an ankylosed hip uh, initial osteotomy, take out that chunk of bone, place your retractors. This is the northwest or a mastoid, two homans. This is an additional homans, and you start reaming within the bone itself, within the cut surface of the head. And the tal is ossified here, so unless you take a nibbler and identify the tall tal, it's going to be difficult for you um, to find the orientation of the cup. Again, two homans placed anterior and posterior to the edges of the tal. The cup goes, the handle goes in between, so your version is dictated. You need to see the posterior superior margin of the cup should be slightly exposed. If there are no osteophytes, to make sure your anti-version is. Correct as well as your inclination is correct. So once you are happy with the trialing, um, I take out the osteophytes after I put my final cup in. As Vikas mentioned, two third of the cup was inserted with hand, and then only you start uh, using your hammer with a short handle. Don't keep on whacking the cup just by parking it at the rim of the acetabulum because you will crack it. Your ex exposure is not good. You won't even notice the crack. And once you got your positioning, and if you I've decided to put in uh, screws for this one for some reason, uh, because our ankylosed patients have porotic bones. So I want an additional um, fixation there, adjunctive fixation, and then take out this osteophyte um, after or bef uh, before you put the liner in actually. And um, so that is the way um, I normally um, put a trial liner, but if you're confident enough, I can go with the final liner as well, and then start with preparation of your uh, femoral stem according to your choice. So I think that was it really about uh, the reaming technique in the acetabulum. And I don't use any special instruments apart from my homans and my mastoid, whatever we call them, Northwest or mastoid retractants for each case, because that is my pain point. If I don't have good retractors, um, I will struggle through the operation. So I will request everyone to have these essential kit of using your own homans. You need to understand where you can place your homans safely. You can use your Judd pins or the Chanley pins if you want, but you need to know exactly where you want to put them in. Um, use a reamer system like a striker or a B Brown, which has got enough torque on it. The problem with some of the locally manufactured systems is there is not enough torque on the system. So there's no point in having a high speed uh, drill available because the, uh, the reamer will get stuck and you won't be able to proceed nicely through the operation. So if you don't have good instrumentation, you will start doubting your technique and you will fall into a trap where you will never ever recover uh, with your confidence level. So make sure you have got essential Get with you good instrumentation, all implant sizes, and make sure you have a good reamer which will allow you to get um, good acetabular reamer. Thank you very much, uh, Mahesh. Uh, that was excellent. And uh, I think we should proceed with uh, Dr. Nikhil Shah, who is ready with his cemented talk. And then yeah. uh, if we have time, we can uh, you know raise some further points. Thank you, Mahesh. Thanks, Kiran. Nikhil? Yeah. Can you see the screen and hear me? Yes. <clears throat> so good evening, everyone. Um, my talk will cover cemented acetabular component, and I'll follow a very similar uh, structure to the talk that Mahesh did. So in order to understand cemented cups, we really need to go back in time and look at a little bit of the history. Till today, the only hip which can boast a 50-year data is the world's most successful implant, which is the first generation Chanli total hip replacement, which was implanted with cement. The first hip was implanted in 1962, 
and almost uh, five and a half thousand hips were done before the first revision was performed. Before hip replacements became successful, the treatment for osteoarthritis was really um, either an excision arthroplasty or an arthrodesis. Now, Chanli was a little bit of a genius. Not only did he work on uh, hip replacements, but he also worked a lot on biomechanics. And he realized, uh, based on his studies of the lubrication of animal joints, that nature has discovered a unique means of making a, a, a mixed lubrication regime consisting of a fluid film and boundary lubrication. So he developed his concept of the low frictional torque arthroplasty. In fact, the first hip replacements that were done, they were not called as total hip replacements. And this might be perhaps an unusual fact that some of you will know. They were called LFAs. They were called low friction arthroplasties. The word total hip replacement actually came a bit later. And what he showed is that if you use a small head size, which was 22.2 to 5 millimeters, then it allows you to have a very low frictional torque, which is transmitted from the cup to the bone cement interface. And this allows the use of a thicker polyethylene and an optimal head neck ratio. A thicker cup exhibits much less strain and so that reduces the loosening rate. And why was it 22.2 to 5 millimeters? Because the lathe that used to make these cups for machining was 7 eighths of an inch. So this size choice was a little bit of a serendipity. So Chanli started experimenting with hip resurfacings. Again, this is not a fact that many people know. So he designed his Teflon resurfacings. Teflon was a good material in terms of coefficient of friction, but unfortunately, it had very poor wear characteristics. So the initial experiments, which were based on Teflon double cup arthroplasties and even um, acetabular components were complete disasters. But he did not give up on discovering what he wanted was the ideal material for a hip replacement. Luckily for him, he worked with a man called Harry Craven, who was an engineer. And Harry Craven also was a very intelligent engineer. In fact, he had designed the spherical grinder to make the perfect spherical head. One day, a German rep from the textiles industries visited Chanli and Craven and showed them polyethylene, which was used as a bushing in the textile industries. Just when the rep came, Chanli was about to go to a ski trip to Zurich. And this is the conversation that took place between Chanli and Craven. What are you testing? Polyethylene. Throw the bloody stuff away. It's no good. And Chanli left at that. Luckily for him, Harry Craven did not throw away the polyethylene. He kept testing it. And when he came back after three weeks, he showed him that the wear characteristics of this material were absolutely brilliant. And effectively, he had discovered the material that he needed for his socket. The next important discovery or application was the use of cement, polymethyl methacrylate. Chanli had a very close association with Manchester Dental School. And he realized from his uh, dental colleagues that acrylic cement can be used to fix these components, the femoral component and the acetabular component to the acetabulum. And he wrote in his book that cement used as a grout was fundamentally the most important element that revolutionized the art and the science of total hip replacement. And thus was born a new operation that was reported in the Lancet in 1961. So we have all the elements that are needed for a successful arthroplasty. We have a high density polyethylene that, in, that solved the wear problem of Teflon. We have cement and the first generation Chanli flatback stem. Now, if you look at the design of the stem carefully, it is actually a tapered polished stem. It was the first a single tapered stem. In 1962, the first LFA was implanted. And by 1965, the first 500 had been completed. And later on, Lancet went on to dis describing this as the operation of the century. So let us look at some of the design developments over the years of the cemented cup. So the first cemented cup was implanted in 1962, which I showed you. Then what happened is, um, in order to improve the resistance to dislocation, Chanli changed the internal geometry of the cup and introduced what is called as the LPW cup or the long posterior wall. After that, a flange was introduced in order to improve pressurization. And then an anatomic flange was made in the OG cup. And finally, we have the marathon cemented cup, 
where marathon uh, was a material that was used uh, after being invented in 1998 so this was the first chanli cemented cup and these are drawings that are, that have directly been taken from the company that made it thackray and then taken over by uh, dipui jnj so you can see how complicated the biomechanics of cup design was even for a simple cemented cup and 1972 the long posterior wall came where there is slight elevation of the posterior wall in order to improve the resistance to dislocation particularly in flexion and this is the lpw cup and you can see that the posterior uh, lip of the cup is elevated then came the flanged cup this was called the pij uh, flange or the pressure injection and the important um, function of the flange was to provide a seal to the edge of the cup so that cement does not escape and helps in pressurization of the cement into the prepared bone surface and then the flange was made a bit more anatomic by introducing the og cup and the og cup continues to have excellent results uh, long term results on the national joint registry in fact when we look at internal data of um, the the hips that we have been done doing at writington hospital we are now almost coming up to 50 year data we have already published the 30 year data and the 40 year data and so this was the og flanged cup marathon was introduced in 1998 this was so the so the main uh, structure of polyethylene which i'm sure all of you know the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene polyethylene is long chain it's a polymer and these long chains are organized in um, in a, in, a, in the same direction and that is what gives polyethylene its amazing tensile strength it's also a very inert material it is a low cost material the machining is not difficult it can be manufactured by either by ram extrusion um annealing can be involved and it's the production cost is fairly low what ultra high molecular weight or crosslinked polyethylene does it is causes crosslinking in these polyethylene chains and improves the wear resistance of the material significantly so the cemented polyethylene cups um crosslink uh, cups were introduced in 2008 in uh, the form of the marathon cups for the dura lock and for the pinnacle so the importance of the marathon cup is again it has the flange which you can use to pressurize the cement the fixation interface was identical to the already established chanli elite cups it has the lpw feature the long posterior wall and it has a wire marker which allows you to judge the position of the cup on your post operative x ray the instrumentation of cemented cups is really very very simple in fact you can probably introduce it with uh, free hand with a little bit of experience if all the other instrumentation fails and the results of marathon have also been extremely good the flange is easier to cut compared to the og cup and it retains the chanli features what is important to understand is not just the cup the success of a hip replacement should look at the whole construct one of the things that chanli realized is that the problem was wear and the wear was because of rubbing of two materials against each other so they found out that when ceramic is used against polyethylene the wear of the head improves very very significantly and in fact some of the earliest uh, results uh, which are still the, the the patients are still going on was the 22.2 to 5 mm ceramic on the old polyethylene the other important thing to appreciate when we look at socket loosening and wear is one of the papers that was written by rublevsky more than 20 years ago and unfortunately it got missed by literature when we look at uh, cup loosenings there are two um, there are the, the distribution of cup loosening is uh, in two time frames the small incidence of early loosening that you get is actually not because of wear it is because of impingement so what was done was to reduce the neck diameter to 10 mm and this reduced the impingement very significantly so the 10 mm neck diameter stem was implanted in 1983 and by reducing the impingement on the socket the rate of loosening reduced even below what was already a very low rate and this was allowed only because of better metallurgy to manufacture the stainless steel stems so you can see how the revision for aseptic cup loosening changed dramatically when the uh, when the neck diameter was reduced from 12.5 to 10 mm the purpose of going back in time and showing you a little bit of history and understanding is it puts us in perspective of, of where we are and what we can learn from history so that we can make the future better and stronger in terms of hip replacements 
So that's a little bit about the design and the biomaterials. So let us look at the surgical technique. So this is the patient on which we will try and do a cemented hip replacement. Uh, templating is extremely important. This is a marker X-ray with a King's mark, which takes into account the magnification as well as the rotation, a standardized X-ray, which is a low centered pelvis with uh, your hips rotated internally so as to reduce the effect of uh, change in the offset. And that's the, the plan for the hip replacement using um, a C-stem classic stem with a 910 taper and a marathon polyethylene cup. So I've got a video which I'll show later, but coming to the steps, I use a posterior approach as well, like Mahesh does in the lateral position. It is very important that you position the patient yourself so you know exactly where the pelvis is. Uh, my first step is to identify the sciatic nerve and uh, to know exactly where the nerve lies. In eight out of 10 patients, I will uh, release the tendon of the gluteus maximus because it immediately uh, decompresses and provides relaxation to the sciatic nerve and virtually eliminates the risk of getting a post-operative foot drop. And I suppose with me and Mahesh both following this step, it probably comes from our background of having trained as pelvic and acetabular surgeons. Once I've done that, I identify the piriformis tendon and the short external rotators as well as the capsule. I tend not to divide the quadratus until the hip joint is dislocated carefully and I tend to divide it from inside out so that you get the osteoperiosteal layer with the quadratus which makes it easier to repair. So I take down the rotators in the form of an inverted U-shaped flap after tagging it with a thick Tychron suture and I take the rotator separately from the capsule. Before the hip is dislocated, I like the superior Chanli pin in the supraacetabular area which will help me mark the length of the patient before the dislocation. And it helps you to document um, and um, assess your leg length after the hip joint has been uh, implanted so that you can try and make your leg length inequality as less as possible. And then you cut your neck and you get a 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum. So that anterior wall retractor that you can see on the left side of the image on the left is actually not an anterior wall retractor. I don't like the retractor on the anterior wall. There was a study published that looks at the distance of the tip of this long Homan's retractor and the vascular structures in the front of the acetabulum. The closer that retractor goes towards anterior and antero inferior, the closer it is to the blood vessels. So what I tend to do is I release the reflected head of the rectus, which is, uh, so if, if this is the right acetabulum, we are looking at the one o'clock position or the two o'clock position. And in that position, you get the reflected head of the rectus, which you just recess with your diathermy. And uh, this retractor then fits in very nicely in a pocket. And it is quite anterior and superior and gives you beautiful 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum without endangering the vascular structures that are present in the front. Now, in this case, I've used a posterior pin in the ischium uh, for the purposes of facilitating the video, but I don't like to use that pin because sometimes the sciatic nerve can wrap around it and the nerve can come into danger. The second retractor is placed just below the tal, and you can see how the tal can be seen beautifully. And uh, it is a very good aid in your socket inclination and your socket version. Once you have established your socket and got the good exposure, then you prepare your socket with the help of your reamers. Again, reaming should be very careful and gentle. Now, unlike uncemented sockets, the purpose of the reaming in a cemented socket is not really to expand the socket at all. It is only to scratch away the cartilage and to get a sufficiently good bony a host bone so that you can cement it properly. So sometimes if your reamers are completely missing, you can still do a cemented hip replacement using a sharp ring curette, which can scratch away the cartilage and then using multiple drill holes. The instruments are simple. You have your reamers. Then in the top right, you have the Rublevsky quarter inch uh, drill. This is a step drill that is used to safely provide the drill holes in order to cement it properly without accidentally penetrating the pelvis and injuring the neurovascular structures. Then you have the cup holder and the cup holder comes in three sizes based on your cup size. So you have one for the 22 millimeter, the 28, and then for the uh, 32 millimeter cups. There's also a cup holder for the 26 millimeter cups. <clears throat> and then you have the rod pusher that can push the cup. 
the rod pusher can also take a head trial and you can uh, pressurize the cup using a rod pusher on a head trial instead of using the cup holder so that's your exposed uh, uh, socket which has now been reamed and you can see so i like to ream in a direction which is going to be the final direction of my cup and the purpose of the reaming like i said is only to scratch away the cartilage on the lower left image you can see punctate bleeding from the bone and i try and preserve the subcondyl bone there is no need to destroy the subcondyl bone the hip replacement has to be made as biologically as po- biological as possible you are trying to save bone for the next hip replacement particularly in young people then i use that uh, step cut drill to make my multiple drill holes uh, in multiple directions and again one of the key is if you find sclerotic white hard bone that you don't want to destroy you can easily counter that by making multiple drill holes into that sclerotic bone i like to make drill holes in the pubic direction in the direction of the root of the ramus and in the ischium so almost like a three point fixation if you look at the original technique of chanli he used to make only three main holes one in the ilium superiorly one in the pubis one in the ischium so these three holes give you really nice three point fixation where cement can be pressurized into the holes then on the left side we have a mixing bowl which is attached to vacuum so vacuum mixing of cement for the cup my standard cement is a cmw2 which is a fast setting cement so for those who are setting out for the first time with a hip replacement i don't recommend a fast setting cement because it literally sets fast that's why it's called fast setting uh, you have get about 2 and a half to 3 minutes to play with it by which time your cup should go inside and it should be well cemented if you miss that then uh, there can be problem so it is better than to use a cement such as palacos that will give you 10 minutes uh, and then you know if you are if you are less experienced you can use a little bit more time that is the cup holder that shows how the cup can be positioned the cup is not sided so the same cup can be used for right and left but what changes is the way you position the wire marker which can be shown in the photograph there are cups available in cement which are sided cups so the right and the left are different it's called the opera cup which we tend not to use so much then you have the pressurizer for the cement that can either be in the form of that blue colored rubber diaphragm or it can be in the form of a balloon that can expand which is filled with water and it can give you very good pressurization of the cement another technique that i often use for pressurizing cement is to actually use my thumb to press the cement directly into each drill hole that i have made carefully then you cut your flange to more or less match the edge of the cup so that you can get a good seal then i clean the cup that has been prepared with pulse lavage so that you get a very dry surface all the debris is washed away then you wash it with peroxide and i pressurize it with a swab which has got hydrogen peroxide on it what that does is it takes away all the blood and all the debris and it gives you a beautiful dry feel it helps to have um, hypotensive anesthesia and so the technique is demanding you really need to take uh, careful precautions when you cement the socket because the key really is to get a strong cement bone mantle once you have a dry surface you can put the cement into it without getting any blood at the interface and then you pressurize it sustained compression the cement then goes inside the hole then you can put your cup in so you can see how the cup holder is holding the cup the direction of the lower border of the cup holder is parallel to the transverse acetabular ligament and that rod if that rod is vertical to the plane of the table or to the plane of the ground then your inclination is between 40 to 45 degrees and sometimes you might want to close the cup a little bit sometimes you want to open it a little bit by a few degrees but i just tend to follow the natural acetabulum and you can see that the edge of the cup matches with the edge of the acetabulum the osteophytes have been already removed i like to remove the osteophytes before i start cementing the cup so my cup is finally prepared when it is cemented and then the rod holder comes off and then just the rod holder with the trial head goes in that gives you enough space to take away some excessive cement a lot of fellows when they come to us they are quite uh, worried about taking excess cement out and instead of paying attention to getting the cup positioned and cemented perfectly they tend to panic with taking the excess cement out it does not matter at all what is more important at this stage is to make sure that you don't move as the cement is setting even if you cannot take the wet cement out at this stage it's not a problem at all once it has set all it needs is a sharp osteotome to knock the set cement out 
and then we'll stop at uh, that in terms of the technique so that's my trial stem that has been inserted and you can see um, the trial reduction which has been done in the trial reduction i will check the shock test which gives me the tissue tension i'll check the leg length i'll take the hip joint through a full range of movement and i'll do the ranavat coplanar test or the combined version test check that the sciatic nerve is not excessively tight also the important things to check when you are moving this is by putting your finger between the anterior neck and the anterior superior part of the acetabulum at this step what you do is you check for host host impingement and uh, or host prosthesis impingement this is very important because impingement is one of the main reasons for instability and dislocations and if you do find impingement it is important to trim that neck osteophyte or trim the neck or sometimes it is the anterior edge of the greater trochanter that causes impingement so once you have sorted that out you know that your your hip is stable then you cement your stem in and you put your final head so kiran shall i shift to, to video yeah how big is it it's about 4 and 1/2 minutes okay please go ahead and then in the end if you have time i've got some cases of um, cemented uh, so the steps that i have just shown you this is a live video so you can see the cup has been exposed i like to see the rim of the cup circumferentially completely 360 degrees that's your pulvinar or the fat pad that's the the reamer and once you have reamed you can see how the reaming is performed very very gently touch and go touch and go i'm not really trying to deepen the cup i'm not trying to destroy the subcondyl bone all i'm trying to do is get punctate bleeding then the osteophyte comes off these are threaded uh, cup sizes which can tell me what cup i want i generally tend to leave about 6 mm difference so if i want to put a 45 by 28 cup the reamer will go up to 51 or 52 maximum then those are the drill holes that are going in and then you clean the drill holes from from the debris by using a small wokman's curet and that's the ring curet that i was talking about so instead of reaming the peripheral bone i prefer to just take the cartilage out of the periphery by using that ring curet and that's my peroxide swab going in the cement is being mixed and you can see you want to try and get a dry cup so if there's some blood over there try and take that blood out if you put a suction catheter at the bottom of the cement it it will suck the blood out and then get nice sustained pressurization twist the rubber diaphragm take it out and then your cup goes in and my finger and the cup holder will push the cup medially first to find the tear drop so i know that my reference point is correct starting from inferior and then the rod the cup holder and the cup pusher go in and then you hold it steady so my two fingers are always on the edge of the cup so that if there is even the slightest movement of the cup i can detect it once i'm happy that the cup is reasonably stable take out the excess cement and then you replace that with a trial head and a rod and then you just hold it steady until the cup has been and i use infiltration as well what is the key is not the infiltration of the wound or the fat on the wound which is very helpful for the bloodless field but the key is the capsular implantation Kiran I can stop the video over here because the remaining part of the video is the stem. Okay, you can stop it here. Uh thanks Nikhil. Do you want me to show cases if you have time or if you want me to leave it I'll leave that. I think uh, we will wait for a few minutes before the cases. Okay. Uh I just want to uh, first of all uh, thank you for this uh, you know wonderful uh, talk uh, uh about the uh, you know the cemented cup and especially the historical evolution of this uh of this cup um a few things i remember uh, from my time in black notley hospital where i worked with mr waddington who was a very close uh, uh, associate uh, with uh, uh, you know professor chanley and 
I remember seeing a lot of uh, X-rays at that time with the Mexican hat. Uh, did you? <laughs> uh, I saw that in your beautiful historical slides. I I could not see the Mexican hat, uh, and uh, we can and you can talk about it a bit later because that was the Chanley's principle of you know medialization and you know the low friction the talk to get a better abductor yeah. lever arm. Yeah, and, and uh, intentionally so, uh, used to make a hole in the floor of the acerebellum so he knows where the pelvis is. Absolutely. And then plug, it, plug it with a little Mexican hat. Absolutely. So that was one. And the second thing is in the imp, in the instrumentation. I think Mahesh and you, uh, you know, emphasize the importance of good Homan's uh, retractors and awareness of the anterior neurovascular structures. You know, it's very very important. The pin can be used, cannot be used. You know, the superior pin. Uh, sometimes the bone is sclerotic or very soft, especially in India. and the asian bones and you know if we can avoid pins you know we can uh, you know go ahead with it so i think uh, i would just say that you know the curet is a very important instrument you know the ring curet and the small curet as you as you realized you know in your demonstration that if you don't have a good ring curet and if you rely too much on the reamers uh, there are chances of reaming too much and the whole idea is to preserve bone so in my instrument uh, you know tray i i rely on the small curettes the curved curett and the ring curett and many times when you do your multiple drill holes uh, nikhil uh, you can also find some geodes or some cysts uh, you know beyond and you have to remove all the soft tissue from the cysts Correct. and you can see the small uh, you know the small drill hole you have to expand it a bit you know yeah. and if it really becomes too expanded sometimes you can use the cancellous bone and impact it in that and then use that you know as a anchor for your cement so Absolutely. i think that is uh, those are the points i want to uh, cover other thing is nikhil did you ever use a suction cannula in the ileum to even get a more drier uh, field or just using the peroxide and uh, hypotensive anesthesia is enough so it was something that is recommended by the exeter group they tend to put a vent or a suction cannula in the ileum by making a hole and attach suction to it and they say that it makes a better difference it's not been traditionally taught at writington so i have not ever used it and you know the data is very similar we have 50 year data they have about 33 35 year data so i don't really think that step is critical so long as your socket is dry absolutely so i think uh, you showed us some very important uh, points like not to move when the cement is curing and when you have put the cup in the desired position that is the most important message to take home and as you are holding and stabilizing the cup the assistant should be taught how to remove the excess cement uh, and especially uh, you must pay attention to the cement which goes beyond the tal and can be a big blob of cement in the post op x ray so you got to really look for that cement as it can escape and you know form a big blob below um the other panelists mahesh narendra and vikas can put their points and if we have time then we can see some cases uh, nikhil sure yeah, i just had one point about the choosing your bone cement uh, i tend to uh, prefer pelagos over other bone cements one it has got the best results in uh, in all the registries that is one and secondly uh, i want my uh, cement to be pigmented i want it to be different from bone because the next surgeon who goes in god forbid somebody has to go in but eventually somebody a few of our cases will be revised at that time the next surgeon should not be abusing me he should be able to clearly differentiate the bone from the cement and that's uh, a fair enough okay. point narendra yeah and thirdly uh, i don't know whether in uk they use antibiotic routinely in the bone cement i prefer yes. to have my uh, antibiotic loaded bone cement always yes never so all antibiotic. so our standard cmw2 cmw1 and palacos which i have have got gentamicin and then for high risk cases if i'm doing a two stage revision for infection i use copal g plus c which has gentamicin and clindamycin or copal g plus v which has vancomycin or you can have copal g plus c and then add up to 2 grams of vancomycin uh, for every for, for 40 grams you can add up to 4 grams if you want that weakens the cement a little bit but uh, you can add extra antibiotics as well So, what is the time of the fast set cement which you use, Nikhil? If the cement has been chilled appropriately and kept in cold um, environment, then you get a little bit of about five to five and a half minutes. If it's a little bit, uh, if it's stored in an environment uh, which is hot, you get four and a half to five minutes. 
So okay. you have to be fairly slick with uh, cementing to do fast setting cement. Because we don't have it in India. At least I have not used it in India. I've used the Palacos uh, cement main, yeah. mainly. Yeah. So when when new fellows new fellows come to me based on their experience, because you know primary hip replacements are largely done by my fellows, and uh, with me teaching them. So we always begin with Palacos, and until I'm confident that they can get out of any trouble that they create for themselves, I'll not let them use fast set cement on the socket. It will be Palacos. That's fair enough. Uh, Vikas, any points? Not, yeah. uh, Mahesh? There are a few points which I'd like to... So first of all, I'd like to compliment Dr. Nikhil for an excellent talk on cemented cups. Uh, with our backgrounds, I understand Dr. Uh, Nikhil do, does max, uh, mainly cemented cups and Kiran comes from a background of cementing and is now doing using essentially both. We... and men, But most of us are mainly uncemented, got exposed to some cemented usage and have adopted cemented into our technique to suit our patients in the best manner. So knowing both is an advantage, but at the same time, knowing both needs more expertise. So uh, one thing I wanted to bring out was about the reamer. Many times our uh, company tech does not set the instrument on reaming. Sometimes he gives you on the drill. So the audience needs to take care that when you're given the reamer in hand, it should be on the ream setting, not drill setting. Otherwise, you can suddenly destroy the acetabulum. The other thing which Dr. Nikhil clearly brought out is the anterior retractor is actually an antero superior and it goes towards the AIIS, so anterior inferior iliac spine. That is the hard and that is the best bone available. And your angled retractor should aim at, as he brought out, around 11 o'clock and that's the AIIS. So reflected head to be removed and go there. Then you would be able to take your femur with it and it, does, it takes the load of the uh, retracted very well that that part of the bone about the reaming uh, it depends on the case actually we have two sets of cases in india basically arthritic hips are less many are avian many are rheumatoid and many are neck femurs so all these need a different set of skills for preparation the bone is soft it is more often a sizing than a reaming when you are doing a uncemented cup so you just scrape and you size and in that one technique which is useful is after your first initial reamer, you do a reverse reaming. So once you reverse, you are getting a size thing, but you may not be preparing the cup. The preparation has already happened with the three punctate bleeding spots. So the whole bone need not bleed. It should be the ischial blush, the iliac, and the pubic blush. If three these three blushes are there, generally your reaming is done. Now you could scrape, you could, as uh, uh, Dr. Nickel and Kiran brought out very well that you need your scrapers and scoops and that holds true both for cemented and uncemented preparation. You should not chase all, bleeding all around. If you do that, you would lose the good subchondral bone. In uh, yeah, One issue which we really face and which I would like Nikhil and Kiran to bring out is, as Nikhil brought out, that when you're doing an uncemented cup, essentially your bone preparation is deciding your cup placement. Although, of course, handling it and holding the uh, inserted in the right position is important, but you are going essentially by internal navigation, the tal, the anterior uh, pubis. Even in a cemented, you are doing that, but while you are inserting the cup, because the of the cement all around and the mantle to be uh, there and some leak leaking cement there, I have uh, you showed that you are using your reference of the handle also. So it's not just you are looking at the tal and the anterior because that may not be seen so well with the cement all around, and now the placement of the cup becomes more important by judging your handle and your jig. So is that the case as compared to the uncemented where your placement can still be navigated by the internal landmarks, which may be not so well seen while finally cementing the cup in. So that is one point. Uh, I'd like. So the uncemented system that we have, so I have the gription and the trabecular metal system, which I occasionally use. And uh, they have these uh, antiversion guides, actually. So you can attach these separate attachments to the rod that you're positioning. And based on the angle, you can measure. So similar handle guides are available for uncemented systems as well. Ultimately, I think what it boils down to is your training and your experience. You use as many bony and as many soft tissue and as many uh, external um, navigation guides that you want to. And it can be as um, um, ridiculous as a square room with the corner of the room or three black dots on the tube light. You know, I've heard people talk about these things, but if it works for you and if it gives you 
your cup positioning within two standard deviations and gives you a dislocation rate of less than 1 to 1.5%, then whatever you're doing is working for you. So I don't really mind which landmarks you use. So long as, you know, overall, if your cup is positioned within, within a normal population. Uh, to add further uh, to Nikhil's points, uh, Vikas, uh, you know, when you are doing the cementing, which was very elegantly showed, when you put the blob of cement inside and pressurize it, okay, and do the steady pressurization, when you come to insert the cup, now uh, the OG cup is a brilliant cup. So when you do the cut of the OG flange and you place it and you see how it covers, that is a number one you know, criteria of the cup position. Number two, when you start to insert the cup, uh, Nikhil uh, showed in the video, but uh, he didn't emphasize on it, is that you put the cup with the inferior edge, you know, in the tile. But before you do that, you remove the excess cement and you push it up, up a bit so that you can see with your eye the inferior edge of the cup going where the tile is, being parallel to the tile, and then you straighten and then you hold the handle. That L-shaped handle is the most elegant and the most simple uh, instrument which gives you a fantastic idea about the abduction and the inclination of the cup. And those two fingers which Nickel uh, held on the flange is very important to uh, prevent the leak of the cement. So I think these two points are important is that when you insert the final cup, you have to pay attention at the six o'clock position near the tile, remove the excess cement and push it up a bit. And then you put the cup and then you close it a bit. Is that right, Nickel? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, later on in the next talks, we could have a proper video on it. Absolutely. Just, just yeah. one last point I wanted to ask Nikhil was, what is your experience or have you used the uh, newer uh, highly crosslink cups, which are allowing now 32 and 36 head, like the rim fit cup or the etc. Or... So the marathon allows a 32 millimeter head. Okay. I don't see any indication whatsoever of a 36 millimeter head in my practice for primaries or for revisions. Unless I'm doing a periprosthetic fracture revision and someone has already put in a well-cemented 36 cup and I don't want to revise it, only then. But uh, the evidence would support that. You don't really need a cup more than 32 millimeters. My standard cup in 80% of my practice is 28 millimeters. In most of the children that I do, <clears throat> the 16, 17-year-olds <clears throat> and the low stature patients, I tend to use a 22 millimeter head and uh, a, we can go as small as a 38 by 22 uh, cemented cup. If the socket is even smaller than that, and I cannot even get a 32 millimeter cement, a 38 millimeter cemented cup, then I'll use a bantam cup because that can be literally implanted in a socket size that is even 40 millimeters diameter socket. Some of the really short people, patients I've done, four foot one inch, four foot two inches, the bantam uncemented cup, you can go to 40. On the bigger side, the biggest I've used is a 32. So elderly patients who are in their 80s, who have early dementia, Parkinson's disease, stroke, or odd neurological conditions, um, they have this thing called restless leg syndrome or chorea athetosis. If I'm doing hip replacements for them, I'll use a 32 millimeter head. The 36 uh, millimeters, I really don't see the indication. So I think we have got just enough time for a few cases. And while you set it up, Nikhil, yeah. I would like to engage Mahesh a bit uh, in his talk on the uncemented cup, Mahesh. Uh, yeah. you, you showed the ankylos the hip. And, uh, you know, in your particular case, after you did the uh, osteotomy, uh, you know, you could you know, uh, externally rotate and get access. Uh, sometimes you can, you may have to do what is called as a napkin ring uh, osteotomy or you know or like a biscuit osteotomy yeah. uh, you know to to re to remove that space and in your case you could actually go with the smallest streamer but sometimes the bone is so small that uh, you again have to use a curette to start using a hand curette and start excavating the bone and then expanding it so i think that's another point just yeah. to you know uh, make in in your presentation mahesh yeah can Nikhil you also the... mentioned about bantam cups. Uh, the bantam cups, we get the striker cup, the smallest one we have available is 36. And the, the bantam cup, which is from Duralock, is about 38. That is uh, being quite often used for us, especially in DDH um, and excision arthroplasty. So we have to use it in certain cases as well. 
Yep. Can you see the screen now? Yes, Aaron? you can go ahead with your cases. So this was just the hip that we started with, the one that we templated, and this is the post-operative X-ray. So you can see if you want to analyze it, you get a whiteout around the socket in all three zones, and you have a whiteout around all 14 zones. Well, I've shown seven zones on the AP, but if you look at the lateral also, in all 14 zones, you get a nice whiteout around the stem. And again, one of the things you'll notice of this stem is that I haven't used a, a cement restrictor in the form of a biostop plug. I actually prefer to use a bone block, but we can discuss that if we do stems in the future. And another X-ray of a C-stem, in this case, I have used um, a void centralizer at the tip of the stem. And this, you can see, is a 22 millimeter head. I'm, um, in terms of survivorship, we know that the evidence is there. So just look can at- I just the, ask you a question, Nikhil? Yes. The C stem, are you guys still using it because it's really been pulled out of um, India and majority of the markets uh, because of the third taper adding it uh, to be rotationally problematic? I think that is a marketing gimmick, Mahesh. We are now having 22 year data on the C stem. It is a brilliant stem. It works extremely well. It's uh, doing well on the NJR. The 9 by 10 taper is a big advantage for me because I use a lot of 22 millimeter heads. Yes, it is less forgiving than the exeter stem in terms of implantation. So the exeter stem has got a square shoulder. So even if a less experienced person does an exeter stem, by and large, it tends to go straight down the femur, whereas the C stem is boomerang shaped. So if you're not trained in implanting the C stem correctly, it goes into varus and at zone seven, you don't get any cementation under the calcar and the stem uh, starts touching the calcar bone directly. And those stems do become rotationally unstable and they may fail. So this is a technique issue and an understanding issue. So what is the long-term follow-up of C-stem that we have now available? So we have... I know uh, for eight years, Roblovsky has published nearly 99 or 100% survivorship. Yeah, I think we have 18 years data. I don't know if Bodo has sent the paper or not. But for mechanical failure, apart from two stem fractures, all the rest are still surviving. So okay. the result is well into the 99%. We have been using both the designs because of our procurement issues. We have both. And uh, one handling issue, as Nikhil rightly brought out, is the shape. But one advantage, I feel, over Exeter, because Exeter, you have to have the full inventory, the extended offsets and the standard. The system, the normal system has a better medial offset than the Exeter uh, standards. And so that is something which we have used in pre-op templating. And often we have over Exeter. At times, we have gone to system. And we have both the inventories and both have been working. The My other concern also with the C-stem is the um, offset is geometric in C-stem. So as you go up in sizes, the offset keeps on increasing, which is um, of a disadvantage as compared to either a CPT or an Exeter, um, which um, allows you to have offsets uh, quite interchangeable, right from 30 to about 50 uh, millial offset with Exeter and also as well as with CPT. Yeah, we, we don't think that the offset is a disadvantage, but probably because we are used to the system. Uh, yeah. The second advantage of C-stem is the length is 133 millimeters. So the cement column is very short, very biological stem. The exeter is 156 millimeter stem. That's almost two centimeters longer. And the way that the exeter cementation is done, more often than not, your cement goes down to 17 centimeters down the femur. Now, if you're then revising it for malalignment or for infection, you're fetching cement down the femur from 17 centimeters as opposed to 14 centimeters. And those last three centimeters can make the difference between needing an extended trochanteric osteotomy or not needing it. So I think it's a question of user preference. Anyway, coming back to the cases. So these are some examples of uh, cemented sockets in um, short stature patients or in dysplastic hips with the use of bone grafting. This was a traumatic intraoperative fracture during the performance of a hemi-arthroplasty that I was asked uh, to come and revise. So I've revised it with a cemented stem and with a cemented socket, and that is the five and a half year data. A lot of people worry that cement will get into the, the fracture and stop healing. And uh, these are really unfounded worries. This was a 28 year old male that uh, came to me with, uh, he had a tiny acetabular rim fracture, but mainly he had a femoral head and a femoral neck fracture. And this was the nine year X-ray that we took last year. I think this year he will come for his 10th year follow-up. And if you look at the hip replacement on the right, it practically there is no wear with ceramic on polyethylene even at 10 years. 
and you know that hip pretty much looks like it was done quite recently this was secondary post traumatic arthritis following an acetabular fracture fixation and uh, a cemented uh, total hip replacement with impaction grafting at a uh, four year x ray this patient will now come back for his seventh year follow up this was a non union of the acetabulum because of my pelvic acetabular practice i got a fair amount of uh, non union and uh, um, a few very odd acetabular reconstruction cases this was reconstructed in a single stage with impaction grafting a cemented socket and fixation of the non union with a posterior column plate you can see that the non union has healed and the socket is also functioning quite nicely when she came back at about 88 or 89 years this is an acute acetabulum fracture in an elderly person whose uh, surgery was delayed because of a pulmonary embolus and by which time the head was pretty much squashed and that's a primary fix and replace using a cemented socket a head graft and a posterior column plate uh, coming on to approximately 5 and a half years this is an interesting case this was a hybrid hip replacement using um, i don't think that's the exeter i think it's one of the tps or the cpt or one of those stems unfortunately it got infected um she was infected for over 2 years multiple failed dare procedures so i've done a two stage revision in the first stage revision all the implant and all the cement comes out and then uh, my preference is to use what i called as the uh, nailed cementoplasty along with non uh, articular spaces and that is the four year follow up of uh, a two stage revision for deep infection and i've intentionally put the primary and the revision side by side and uh, if i were to show you only the second x ray of the revision i think many of you will not be able to tell that that was actually a revision you know it looks like a primary and that's the idea of doing cemented hips you know make your revisions look like a primary go biological give back bone preserve bone go small rather than go large this was an ankylosing spondylitis and uh, i think this uh, x ray was taken at 12 years follow up of a cemented hip replacement Uh, this child was 17 years old multiple operations on his right hip with uh, slipped upper femoral epiphysis a very oblique fixed um, adduction flexion contractures of the pelvis a destroyed femoral head so quite a complex hip replacement and that's the x ray at 4 years with a little bit of heterotopic ossification and a 22 mm ceramic on polyethylene bearing again this was a very syndromic hip i can't remember what the syndrome was but she had multiple problems with her knees uh, foot and ankle her spine and upper limb are uh, very very challenging hip very very tight tissues so a lot of planning was required and we had to use the small uh, size stems so on the right side that's the small exeter with a 25 mm offset and augment to restore the superior defect we used the augment because the bone quality was uh, a bit um, un, you know uncertain i wasn't very confident of using a head graft and that's a cemented socket and then we yeah. did a similar one left side where the size of the socket was extremely small like i explained so on the left side we went for a bantam and a femoral shortening and uh, that's a femoral shortening with a cemented stem and again you can see that the osteotomy has actually healed and cement is not really a problem in getting the osteotomies or shortening or fractures to heal uh, and i'll leave there the host to host uh, impingement uh, on the first hip you did sorry was there any host to host impingement on table uh, with the offsets you know it was yes, the hip was hip. the hip was incredibly tight but once mm -hmm. we had uh, got the trial reduction done and uh, does the adequate releases and uh, excising the hypertrophic bone then there was no impingement okay okay and then finally i leave you with this uh, x ray of a 50 year follow up of the first generation uh, cemented chanli with um, a 22 mm head and look at the socket uh, where you know you can barely see anywhere at 50 years now this is old fashioned polyethylene old fashioned cementing technique uh, no vacuum mixing uh, there's a hole in the medial wall so some cement goes into the pelvis and you know you get 50 years out of it thank you excellent uh, excellent thank you very much uh, mahesh uh, and nikhil uh for this uh, you know beautiful uh, discussion on uh, you know cemented and uncemented cups uh, uh one, one point uh, 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 nikhil is that you said that the c stem is very uh, unforgiving and technique dependent okay yes 
Now, uh, uh, just in one or few or two sentences, can you just tell us, uh, you know, the technical, uh, you know, challenges in a C stem, and you know, when you broach and prepare it, you know, how different it is from the, you know, the other well-performing uh, philosophy of the Exeter. Um, and uh, I see I that in all your, yeah, gone. Uh, I see that in all your X-rays, uh, there is a lot of cement uh, around the shoulder and around the trochanter, greater trochanter. So, just in a few sentences, can you tell us, uh, you know, the technical tips in a C stem? I could have actually shown you the remaining part of that video because that's what the C stem is. But effectively, well, it's important to get your entry point as lateral as possible. That's I the saw first that. Step. Yes. Mm -hmm. The second is. Um, get 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 a straight entry point into the femur down the freeway. I use a wooden handle. I don't use the the handle that grips the stem, because even minor movements in the handle are transmitted to the stem as big movements and they create voids. The second is your thumb is on the calcar, so that you get zone seven cementation, and then because the, sh the shape of the C stem is boomerang shaped, you always get a little bit of cement over the shoulder, and that's very useful because. Maybe you, some of you might have seen it, but occasionally when the exeter stem dislocates and when you pull the hip, you manipulate it and you put the hip back into it, if there is no cement on the shoulder, the stem basically just comes off because it's a very square shaped stem. I've seen it twice. With the C stem, because it's boomerang shaped, uh, you have a little bit of cement on the shoulder, that problem is avoided. But if you ever hold a webinar on the stem, I'll show you the remaining part of the video of doing the C stem. The main thing is this, a lateral entry point and zone seven cementation. Excellent. So I think that really uh, covers uh, all the important things uh, which a uh, uh, hip replacement surgeon uh, you know, can be prepared uh, when he uh, goes to tackle uh, a cemented or an uncemented uh, hip. And, you know, we have a few minutes for uh, closing comments uh, by the panelist, Surendra, uh, before would, we... Yeah. Uh, I have one, this is an excellent talk by Nikhil and uh, Mahesh as well. Um, I have a question to both of you. Like, uh, when, both of you had mentioned that you release the gluteus maximus uh, when you are, uh, that which helps you for uh, translating the femur on the anterior side while preparing the acetabulum. Uh, by doing that thing, we get a good 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum. So my question is that when we are doing a final trial and when we are doing a, a shucks test, do you reattach the gluteus maximus muscle and then do the shucks test or you do it uh, without reattaching it? Because it has got uh, some implication on the uh, soft tissue tension. So what is your take on it? No, I don't do it. I um, usually suture the gluteus maximus right at the end. And you should do it only because it will maintain the shape of the buttocks. But otherwise, um, I don't think it really affects um, that significantly on the offset um, or on the uh, uh, decision of my choice of implant. Yeah, I agree completely. I don't think the shock test is affected by the gluteus maximus. Okay. Thank you. And also, you don't have to completely release the gluteus maximus. I mean, there's always a very notorious bleeder at the very uh, end of the tendon. So you just uh, use your finger and titrate your cut on the gluteus maximus. The Obviously, there, a... have, there's one just point I wanted to br uh, bring out. The difference in our practice and uh, maybe Dr. Likhil's is that he is dealing mainly with arthritic hips. And we are also dealing with lax, rheumatoid, neck femurs. and well, Actually, the, that's not true Vikas, because we are a okay. tertiary center. Your trauma you it, your... Yeah, you name it and I get it. You know, trauma, okay. infections, uh, old sepsis, congenital so is... hip, his hip disorders, ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid, okay. spinal pelvic problem. I showed you several syndromic hips. You know, we are still getting syndromic hips, bone dysplasia. So, but next spectrum of getting... hips. Like yeah, neck femur. Yeah. We are about to publish um, data on 110 total hips for neck of femurs using In... a standard 22 millimeter on a 28 millimeter head with uh, or less than 1% dislocation. So in those cases, I would like to uh, differ a bit that we uh, decide about the, although Dr. Anamath has published on this, that if you don't release the GMAX insertion, the chances of sciatic nerve palsy are much more. However, 
uh, in a lax hip and as dr surendra brought out yeah you don't need to release it i agree that yeah you, you need, not, need to and, release and then the shuck test does get affected a bit so not that you need not do the shuck test but you should keep it in mind that this shuck test is after complete release so which yeah. may be slightly more lax and little tolerance to that laxity should be allowed and that uh, stability feel may not be the same so uh, not just that but in neck of femurs you don't release the capsule either try and keep yeah. as much of the circumferential capsule intact yeah otherwise the hip becomes quite uh, decompensated and to the viewers i would like to just add dr nikhil brought up a very good presentation showing all types of cases but though that is like using cement to the head like uh, going to all kinds of cases and it's very nice to know that many things which we thought cannot be dealt with cement he has shown that beautifully it could be dealt yeah. with a predictable outcome so knowing that uh, also uh, broaders are horizon of options when we deal with a case i think vikas what is important is people should stop viewing cement and uncemented as a competitive technique yeah. it is not really that you know it is important so i did two, two fellowships i trained in cemented hips and then i went to canada and trained in uncemented hips and the reason is if you are going to deal with everything from a child to the most complex pelvic discontinuity you have to have in your armamentarium multiple different techniques so it's important to be familiar with cemented hips uncemented hips cages cup cages taking cages out uh, plating acetabular fixations they they are complementary techniques it's important just to to learn to do both yeah just one more just one point i wanted to just bring out one case you showed in fact two cases one where there was a, a fracture and one where you created a fracture by your ostomy so these cases when you cemented a stem you first cabled and made sure that the tube is complete and did not allow cement interference or you did not bother about the cement getting into the you do the you do the cabling first if your if your canal is wide then i do femoral impaction grafting okay. but if the so canal is not impact. wide then you don't bother with impaction grafting one of the problems is what people believe is that they stop the cement from coming out of the fracture by putting a finger on it mm -hmm. that is actually counterproductive if there is a defect there let the cement come out of it and then you clean it out okay but try and get accurate apposition and i have not yet seen uh, healing problems in uh, acute or subacute fractures because of cement yeah i have uh, one question only to both nikhil as well as mahesh uh, probably first to mahesh because mahesh is about to leave uh, the uh, thing what, what do you see as the future trends in the materials especially uh, you know uncemented there is a lot of development going on uh, in terms of cups do you think uh, the composite materials have a future same thing for nickel what do you think is the uh, do we continue to use the same thing or uh, is there any change in biomaterials which we use in cemented epithroplasty mahesh you mahesh are muted yeah for the uncemented i don't think there will be any major changes um, i think we have uh, the advanced in growth surfaces now which are very common as kiran has also cautioned about um, any implant that is being introduced unless it stands the test of time i don't really like to use it but the trabecular metal has been on um, uh, in the literature being published very well and documented for a long time so i'm sure that is going to life much easy scenarios as well similarly each company <coughs> is now coming up with their variations of it for revision scenario the redap cup is fantastic as well i've used it uh, works very well but no long term results as yet so whatever happens i will still rely on what is and rather than chasing new tech blind it's not chasing it's probably being aware of what is uh, what might help you in some difficult situations Yeah, I mean there are variety of uh, implants which are available for us, um, and obviously you need to sometimes um, use them even if it is not scientifically proven or there are not many cases of them. Then you just have to use it. But otherwise, for a standard hip or a standard knee replacement, I would stick to um, what has been proven beyond doubt. I mean, I am not even using dual mobility for young active patients as yet. Whereas, whereas lots of my Uh, colleagues here are using it left right and center pro allowing patients to squat and sit down i'm still a bit skeptical but that, there i agree with you completely yeah okay i think uh, we are running uh, 
very close to uh, a cut off time and uh, if there are no pressing uh, points to make uh, by you know all on the screen can we conclude this webinar yeah thanks a lot kiran and nice to see you all okay nikhil mahesh thank, thank you very much thank you thank you nikhil thank you mahesh narender thanks all Ashok. thanks everyone thanks surendra yes thank, thank you. you thank you thank you very much